Okay, welcome everybody. Is it right um, side? My name is Steve Cohen. That's the more important. And uh, I'm executive director of the Earth Institute here at Columbia and uh, a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about microgrids, a smart solution to optimizing local energy opportunities. So, welcome. I'll give a very brief introduction, I'll introduce the panel. I'll start asking the panel some questions. After I run out of steam, I'll be counting on you to ask some questions. And then somewhere between 7 and 7.15, uh, we will find the wine and beer in the back and continue the discussion uh, the way that I used to discuss in graduate school, uh, usually in a bar. So we'll simulate the bar environment and, and try to harangue these guys one at a time. So let me start by just saying that uh, Storm-related power surges in the United States cost billions of dollars each year. And as we continue to experience environmental disasters like Hurricane Sandy, we need to plan for a more climate-resilient future. Microgrids are local power grids that can be used during power outages, such as those seen during hurricanes and heavy storms. But they can also uh, be used in other ways. With events like Superstorm Sandy becoming more frequent, a shift toward increased microgrid application seems inevitable. Policymakers, engineers, and investors should come together to maximize the economic and environmental benefits of microgrid deployment. A true microgrid, though, is much more than a backup system, as we're going to learn tonight. It uses real-time on-site controls to match the microgrid's generation and storage capacity to power buildings in real time. It has to interact with the power grid to make sure it's working for the benefit of the building and the grid alike. However, we need to move the conversation from backup generation to fully functioning microgrids that could sell their power back to the grid to maximize the technology's full potential. And so that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. Tonight's panel focuses on current applications of microgrid technology as well as opportunities for future growth using a combination of public policy which is something I know a little bit about, innovations in financing, which I know less about, and new technology, which these guys are gonna tell us a lot about. So I'm pleased to introduce our panel of experts. And let me begin by introducing Matthew Ferry, who is the Director of Sales for New York and New England at Pareto Energy, which designs, builds, owns, and operates microgrids and serves to provide less expensive, more reliable, and cleaner electric power. Matthew has over 25 years of experience in technology, specifically in renewable energy resources, combined heat and power systems, fuel cells, power storage, and energy management systems. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from him. Next to him is Joshua Milberg, who serves as the regional vice president responsible for Midwest operations for Will Dan Energy System, where he is responsible for building their Midwest practice and also leveraging his unique background in energy efficiency and smart grid technology and strategy to support national efforts. In addition, he's a founding board member of the Institute for Sustainable Energy Development and served as the first deputy commissioner of the Department of Environment for the city of Chicago from 2009 to 2011. Seated right next to him is Dr. Vijay Modi, who is a colleague of mine here at Columbia at the Earth Institute and at the School of Engineering. He's a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia University and a member of the Earth Institute faculty. His expertise is in the fields of energy sources and conversion, heat mass transfer, and fluid mechanics. Currently, he's focusing on three projects, uh, leading the infrastructure team for the Millennium Villages project, uh, developing planning and decision-making tools for infrastructure, and looking at the food, energy, water nexus in Indian agriculture. And last but not least is the man who I'm told is the guru of uh, the smart grid, uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Shahidapur, who is the Bodine Chair Professor and Director of the Robert W. Galvin Center for Electricity Initiative at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He is an expert in electric power system optimization and control with specific interests in the modeling of electricity markets with microgrids and sustainable energy applications. His perfect power project, which is funded by the Department of Energy, has converted his home campus to a smart microgrid 
with a 20% reduction in its base load consumption and 50% reduction in peak load consumption. He leads a consortium of industry and academic researchers which study the next generation of wind turbine technology. So that is our panel. And this is a very impressive group of people who are going to teach us all tonight about something I'm very eager to learn about, which is the smart grid technology. So to start with, and I think I'm going to start at that end with Professor Shahidapur, what exactly is a microgrid and how does it differ from a smart grid? So what are we talking about tonight? First of all, I'm very uh, glad to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, a microgrid, the way it is defined by the U.S. Department of Energy, is a system that can be operated as an island. So uh, you cannot call, let's say, building a, a microgrid if it doesn't have its own generation. So uh, it is different from, let's say, traditional power systems because it really doesn't have any transmission system. The whole job is done at the distribution level, very much. And it, uh, what's the difference between a microgrid and a smart grid? Well, smart grid sets of a microgrid. So when you talk about microgrid, the elements of a microgrid represent a smart system, smart grid. I want to point out that microgrid is not a new subject. If you go to many third world countries and small villages, they used to have microgrids. There was a diesel generator or some kind of generating facility feeding power to the village without having any connection to the larger grid. What has made the subject to be intriguing, different, what we are discussing is the fact that the elements are smart to the point that they can shift flow, they can modify generation, they look at the uh, future opportunities for enhancing load and all of that. And one other subject that I want to bring up before I stop is that what makes the system to be smart, when we talk about smart grid, smart microgrid, is not the element that is smart, it's the people that are smart. In a sense, when we set up smart grid, let's say in Chicago or New York or somewhere else, we basically bring in the customers. So customer participation makes the system smart. Because in old days, the way you set up the system or you operated the system was there's an outlet, you plug your computer in and the computer was turned on. But now you decide when you want to use power, how much you want to use, what the base is, and all of that. So the smart grid really is a smart customer, it's a smart user, not the smart system. Although collectively, everything is smart. So in other words, according to what you're saying, the US Congress will never have a smart grid uh technology for anyway VJ why don't you add to that uh, definition if you will sure thank you first of all um, I'm not an electrical engineer so I'm going to try my I'm not way. an engineer at all <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, what Muhammad described is that a uh, microgrid as something that can also operate in an islanded fashion now, I work in many settings where you are working on an island, so there is no larger grid to connect to. And so, in that sense, sometimes you have a microgrid or mini grid, which is all standalone by itself. And I think that I want to just a little bit discuss the sort of words you will see in the literature. When you sometimes see microgrid, mini grid words, they could be of hugely different scales. Uh, when a bunch of customers, you know, string wire across each other and share a generation source, that could be a few kilowatts, that could be the size of a small generator in terms of generating capacity. It could, the power could come from any source, could be from solar, could be from uh, a small hydro facility, small micro hydro or so on. Then you see, you know, in many parts of the world, you know, Haiti, I was just in Indonesia a couple of months ago. Indonesia is 15,000 islands with 5,000 inhabited. So those 5,000 islands, many of them, hundreds of them have mini grids of the kind he described where several hundred customers are served by one, um, one generator. And then to leap to New York, um, Many of you, if you have gone to one Penn Plaza uh, midtown, 
the building, which is what, 55, 60 story building, has six megawatts of generation capable that can connect, that is connected to the grid to supply access, but if the grid fails, it can supply the building, and even if the grid play fails, it has what is called a black start capability so that it can start by itself. So that's the New York City version, and that's at a megawatt scale. So just wanted to uh, give my... Thank you. Josh, what would you add to the definition that we've heard so far? Sure. So thank, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always great to come to New York from uh, a flyover state. So I appreciate the opportunity to come speak at this wonderful uh, facility. Um, I certainly take much more of a strategy and policy perspective on microgrids. And what I think is most exciting from, from that perspective is the opportunity for large users, for large facilities to really optimize their um, energy usage for the needs of their particular facility. And so it allows you to make decisions based on what's most important for you as an operating entity. So what does that mean in practice? Well, you have the opportunity to optimize for reliability. You have the opportunity to optimize for cost. You have the opt opportunity to optimize for sustainability or some combination therein. And that is, a, that is a really exciting opportunity. So you're suddenly making decisions for your, own, for your own facility as opposed to being at the mercy of the larger grid operator who's really making decisions to make sure that the entire grid is as stable as possible. And as we move forward, that's gonna become more and more important. Um, no one cares about microgrids, at least from my perspective, when there aren't storms and when you can walk into the room and flip on the lights and the lights turn on. Uh, what they care about is um, both at, at the back end when they're seeing what are the various impacts, but also when there are significant problems. And having a microgrid really allows you to take control back of your, uh, of your energy usage. Matthew, what would you add to the, that definition? Is there anything left that ha you, we haven't heard so far? Just may, maybe a different twist. First of all, thank you uh, to be invited here tonight with the other panelists. Um, you know, my view of this is that I think uh, if we look at the macro grid as something that we want to make into a smart grid, I think it's impossible to achieve as it is in one big operational mass. So to break it down into bite-sized pieces or load pockets that we can control is the future of where the microgrid market is going to be. I think that decentralization of energy, the analogy I would like to use would be very, very similar to cellular networks taking over from uh, landlines and making the, in the end product a much more versatile, user-friendly thing. I think if you look at what is a microgrid to the west coast, it's a different thing than what a microgrid is to the east coast. The west coast seems to be capacity driven, the east coast is reliability driven. You know, we all know that since Superstorm Sandy, resiliency has become everything to the market here. Uh, and our colleagues from Chicago here, somewhere in between the two, uh, capacity issues and reliability issues. But it's a way of breaking down uh, energy use into bite-sized pieces, lowering losses from transmission waste and also lowering carbon footprints and passing savings back to the users. Thank you. You know, I, I was thinking about, I mean, I teach management, so one of the things I've noticed uh, in the way organizations are run around the country is that uh, big vertically integrated companies uh, have pretty much disappeared and are replaced by networks of organizations, in part because of advances in shipping technology and communications technology. One of the only places we haven't seen this yet is in the energy industry, and in, in particularly in, with, with electric utilities, but I think you see the same thing in all aspects of the, of the energy industry. So let's talk about the winners and losers here. Let's talk about the utilities. Uh, are they likely to be interested in this? Uh, what would their take be on it? Uh, what's their attitude been? We'll, we'll start at this side and work our way down that way. So Matthew, you get the first crack okay, at that Thank one. you. Um, I think that you know, the, the winners and losers, we can look at the situation differently. It could be a win-win situation for everyone. I think that microgrids are very well suited to public-private partnerships in the right circumstances. I know the utilities have some difficult constraints uh, with legally what they can do as far as owning generation assets. There's nothing to stop the utilities getting into this market, improving the resilience of their grid, 
and rate basing and making money from the microgrids. So it's, it's a shift of the, the business model. Nobody's trying to put them out of business. Okay, Josh. They do a very good job. Okay, Josh, what do you think? Can we, are the utilities in favor of this? Uh, what about those commissions that run the utilities? Well, I think it's an excellent question because you have, it's really a, a big political game, right? And so the challenge that you have is that you have some utilities and those utilities happen predominantly to be in, in areas where the public utility commissions are more progressive that are looking at this as an opportunity to really change their model, change the way that they have historically operated. I think that the challenge is that you are talking about very large, slow moving organizations with cultures that are very resistant to change. And at the same time, you're talking about CEOs who are are uh, hung in absentia when, when the lights go out. And so how do you make sure how, that they, they need to feel confident and comfortable that the technology is there and the technology works? Um, at the same time, they need to feel like they're actually going to get rate recovery. To me, there's an opportunity here for utilities to either have a really huge impact or alternatively to find themselves in some pretty significant trouble, not in the next few years, but over the next 20 years or so. And, and those utilities that are investing now and in looking at ways to change their business model will certainly come out on the, on the positive end that Matthew was talking about. Those that are obstinate and are only looking at the way that it's are always been done, I think will have a very difficult time adapting as you see the first movers start to, start to move. BJ, what's your take on the utilities on this? Okay, so first of all, Matthew and Joshua have been very generous and abstract. I'll be a little bit more specific. <laughs> so um, I think if you have, you start to be very efficient at your home and reduce your consumption by, let's say, half. Or you start to generate your own power, half of the power. What is the utilities perspective going to be? So, I'm, the New York City tariff structure today is such that if I, as a homeowner, only about one-fourth of what I pay to Con Edison actually goes for the electricity that Con Edison has to buy. So, if I reduce my consumption or start generating less, what the utilities claim is going to be that three-fourths of its costs are actually not changing. <laughs> right? That they are fixed. It sounds now, like tuition actually, doesn't it? <laughs> so, but I think that we need to think about a pathway that if systematically a large-scale change occurs, how can it be a win for the utility as well as individual and for society. And I think that this is a tricky question which one needs to break down the internal cost structure and business model of the utility. The Public Service Commission needs to understand that model and allow for changes that incentivize more of what is good for society while ensuring everybody is happy. Now, I can go in more detail, but I think I'll stop there. I want to, you know, so, so I talked about efficiency, I talked about self-generation, those both, you know, have to reduce consumption. Then there is local storage, so that if you start storing some energy at home, you are shifting your demand from sometimes what is at peak to off peak, but still consuming the same total. For that, the utility is a clear winner. Okay. Mohammed, what's your take on the utilities? We were talking about this before. The, the thing is that whether or not you set up microgrid in the sense that we discussed earlier, uh, individuals in, uh, in various parts of the country have already set up a virtual microgrid. When you see the shop owner buying a backup generator because he or she is worried about losing power, that sort of creates a semi-definition or semi-virtual microgrid, which essentially adds nothing to the reliability of the system, but increases the marginal cost of operating the system. If everybody, every household owner, every shop owner, every tall building start having backup generators because they're worried about the reliability. That is the most expensive way of operating electric power system. 
So migrating to a microgrid, you sort of get rid of that. You, you localize the control to the point that individuals, whether they're tall building or, or a restaurant, don't have to worry about generating electricity or feeding load that they have at the critical time. Now, microgrids in general represent three major goals in every society. One is the reliability. The other one is the sustainability. And the third one is the economics and energy efficiency and demand response and all that. Now, not every microgrid is supposed to respond to all those three uh, criteria. You sometimes set up a microgrid only for reliability purposes. Sometimes you set it up only for sustainability because you want to reduce uh, carbon emission. But most of the microgrids are essentially the first generation of microgrids who have been established for reliability purposes, because people are worried about not having electricity or, or, or depending on where it's located, you need to come up with a system to make sure that the power is available. And if you only consider reliability, setting up a microgrid is, is a winning uh, uh, sort of a scenario for utilities. Because like in Chicago, utility spends millions of dollars every year just to be able to respond to 100 hours of peak in the summer. So if somehow those 100 hours could be shifted or could be eliminated, then that a few hundred million, I mean, a few million dollars could be uh, you know, sent back or returned to the customers. So reliability by itself or responding to reliability represents a very justified reason for setting up micro in many places. But as I said, it could be for other reasons, namely economics that uh, Matthew pointed out in the uh, western part of the United States or for, uh, for sustainability, not so much in the US, but places like in China and other places where there is a great demand for cleaner environment. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, just to add one note, uh, the win-win situation, I'm sorry, the win-win situation for the utility. If we add more generation within a microgrid, it de-stresses the macro grid. So it also means that if uh, everybody works together and we look at this the right way, um, we could actually defer a lot of costs that um, go to utility companies such as substation upgrades, transmission upgrades, by relieving the, the overall stress on the grid. Okay, so what I'd like now is maybe the audience like me is ignorant of what this actually is. So this is story time. I want you to think about some interesting examples of microgrid deployment that you've seen uh, that you could describe to the audience and just say, this is what it looks like, this is what, what it, how it operates. So, uh, Mohammed, why don't we start with you and work our way down here. Just is the most vivid examples of these you can think of, and we'll try to get some variety in different places. There are a number of installations in the U.S. that are sort of moving toward being a microgrid. They are not really microgrid. You know, a typical example for a microgrid is an aircraft or a ship where they generate their own electricity and they're not really connected to any other system. Uh, an aircraft is a perfect example because you have control systems, you have customers, you've got load, you've got generation and all that. But I can uh, talk you know, quite a bit about the microgrid that we have at the university and I explain that. Um, one area, I mean one sort of group of uh, customers in the country that are really showing or is really showing an interest, quite a bit of interest in the microgrid is the military. Uh, either in the, here in the US or, or uh, abroad, they are interested in setting up microgrids to the point that they can manage their load. In particular, if it's somewhere outside the United States where the frequency is different, voltage is different, and, and the power quality is a major issue. So, so what, what we have done at the university is that we have set up this microgrid that is mostly funded by the Department of Energy. And we operate the system as an island. We can uh, disconnect the campus from the larger grid. So if uh, there, there, is a, there is an event in Chicago, uh, God forbid, then we can keep the lights on at the university. And we, have, we do, we uh, sort of go through the drill, we uh, exercise that on a, uh, you know, different seasons in the summertime, summer peak, in the winter, to make sure that we are ready in case we have to do that. But we do it primarily at this time for reliability purposes. We do not create the microgrid for economic reasons. We just want to keep the lights on. So as I pointed out, uh, there are a number of 
examples everywhere that people are moving in that direction. Many of the microgrids that exist uh, in various parts of the world, they still don't have enough generation to be self-sufficient. So they still rely on the grid. Uh, they still have examples of that to some extent for economic purposes. But when it comes to sort of Brazilian operation and reliability, they still are not able. Unless they do a lot of load shedding, they reduce their load significantly, they won't be able to operate it as an island. Well, we are able to do that. Now, of course, when you operate it as an island, there are a number of issues, frequency, voltage. You have to make sure that uh, you keep all the motors running, air conditioning is running, so the frequency is a big issue. How do you manage that? Losses, voltages, a lot of electrical stuff that you have to worry about. And, uh, you know, uh, making sure that the system can be uh, connected back to the grid once the grid is back into operation. So it entails to a lot of details, engineering details that, that we worry about. But the, the one that we have is, is sort of a model that we use in order to uh, educate other people, individuals, uh, entities who are interested in microgrid as to how it can be operated. And I want to go back to the issue that I raised earlier, that, that microgrids in a primitive sense existed 100 years ago, 50 years ago, in, in various places, except it wasn't, you know, it was a very primitive. But there were examples, there are examples, and in particular you'll see that in like remote locations in other parts of the world, where uh, the system is operated as a microgrid. Uh, you know. We worked on a project number of years ago in the northern part of Canada, where, uh, you know, these uh, summer resorts where they, they, it's a truly a microgrid. They have a local generation and they turn it on when people show up in the summer. And in the winter, when people go back home, they turn everything off. Of course, they don't do any demand response. They don't do any, any fancy uh, you know, frequency control and all that. But they operate the system. And if, uh, if there's a problem, they turn the lights off, everything off, if they cannot manage it. But it is, in, based on the definition of a micro, uh, U.S. Department of Energy, it is a microgrid. Okay, Vijay, some examples? Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about our work in Africa. Um, we, are, we were in, a, in, a, in many countries in Africa and in India. You have utilities that, because of complex political economic reasons, are not viable or not making money, they are unable to provide reliable service to the customers, and as a result, they don't have the capital or financing to actually expand their networks to reach customers that are currently not having service. There are probably about 500 million in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are probably 400 million such people, 500 million people in India. So you're talking about little over a billion people in a setting where the utility is not reaching them. So we thought that is there a way we can make this problem, and I like what Matthew described, bite-sized, can we sort of unlock finance at a small scale, kind of like could be a franchise model, could be a bite-sized model where somebody could locally invest in a local grid, which would potentially be connected to the larger grid in time. Kind of the exact opposite of what we are talking in the US, where we started out big and now trying to island ourselves, right? So here, in this setting, you know, what we learned is that value engineering, so really thinking about driving down costs of smart metering, thinking modular, we have deployed 16 such microgrids, and they are really small. So each grid is reaching maybe 20 customers. But we are learning a lot, and the features it has, it has demand-side management. It has time-of-day pricing. It actually can alert a customer in a rural setting about if you have not sufficient generation, you can alert a customer to say, we have less available, so a customer doesn't get fully disrupted, but only has, maybe can turn on one light instead of two, or leave something else on that is critical to them. And in that sense, 
it is a smart mini grid. It has demand side management, supply side management in case, and it is currently, these are run on solar with battery storage, and they provide us a vehicle to understand how a local grid could even, it's such a local decentralized system as demand grows, could become part of a larger network. Now, one of the challenges that we observe, which is very interesting and it's going to affect us here in the US too, the cost of decentralized storage is very high. Currently, one is using lead acid batteries, but there are innovations along the way that will allow that to change. And, you know, we are looking at those, how to integrate those. So how to minimize storage through good management and how to improve storage capacity is a lesson that is coming out of this work. And, but one thing we are learning, which I think Mohammed hinted on, that even the very poor value reliability, they value the ability to make small payments and they value a service-based approach where they don't have to own the utility, so to speak. So. Okay. Thank you, BJ. Josh, some examples of smart of microgrids. Sure. So, so my favorite example, uh, you have the you have the father of that microgrid. So it's a little hard to speak about the IIT microgrid with Mohammed on the panel. But one one microgrid that I've been very impressed with is one that's been deployed um, in Southern California on a military base. And what I what I particularly enjoy about it, and one one point that I didn't make in the last question was there are things that utilities are historically good at and continue to be good at, which is providing reasonably reliable, although depending on where you are, that changes, reasonably reliable and reasonably inexpensive power uh, on demand and when you need it. And one of the things that I really like about the microgrid that the military is deploying in Southern California, among other places, but certainly at 29 Palms, is um, that it does take advantage of being part of the broader grid, it, but it, it has the ability to island, it has the ability to take advantage of renewable resources, it does integrate energy efficiency, it does look for opportunities for, for vehicle electrification, it does look, look for opportunities for demand response, um, but what I particularly like about it is that it is also looking at, at creating a brain on top of all of this. And, and when you think about microgrids, the independent technologies are not in and of themselves very, very sexy or new. It's what, what makes them exciting is this brain on top of them that makes them, that makes them usable. And I really, I really like where, where we're going with that. You're seeing that in the military, you're seeing that at IIT, where you're putting together these algorithms that really allow you to optimize for what matters to you, um, but also take advantage of what utilities are historically pretty good at, which is providing, providing uh, cheap electricity, here, at least here in the US. So Matthew, some stories you could tell us about microgrids. Okay. So I think that um, the difference between, one of the big differences between the small scale systems that VJ was talking about and the larger scale systems that we're going to need for places like New York City is, uh, if you like, the, the piece that we haven't discussed this evening is the microgrid controller. You know, I like to think of that in simple terms as the router, which is the piece that we're going to plug in all of the generation. Um, it's electron agnostic. It doesn't care if its power is coming from wind or from solar or where it comes from. But it allows you to integrate a lot of different resources and come out with a very, very favorable result. Um, as the panelists said, the microgrid technology isn't new. Our development engineer in our company used to work on systems 20, uh, 20 hours drive north of Toronto and you would see oil and gas uh, exploration fields that were thousands and thousands of acres and usually six or eight hundred feet underground that took 45 minutes to drive around. You can imagine it's a small city. So in that kind of paradigm, some technology that's very durable and very tough came out of it to uh, keep production going so that everybody in Canada had oil or gas or both. Um, and I think that's one of the you know, development areas that you'll continue to see. But I think also the military has really paved the way an aircraft carrier is basically a microgrid in its truest form. It has multiple sources of generation. It has some pieces are mission critical, other pieces are not mission critical. So it can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
Okay, thank you. So it sounds like an interesting set of ideas, and you know, I'm the political scientist in the crowd, so I'm sort of interested in what are the major political, technical, financial hurdles to getting these things implemented in a widespread way. So, Mohammed, why don't we start with you and work our way down here? I mean, why isn't this happening, or what do we need? What can we do to overcome these obstacles? Also, well, if you if you uh, sort of re re uh, review the history of electric power system, oops, the electric power system it actually started from a microgrid, and it started here in New York. So, when Edison built the first uh, generating station here. Uh, in 1881, it was a microgrid. There were no large systems. He pulled up uh, wire to local houses and businesses, and that's how he made money. So then we started building this large uh, generating system because it was more economical, because you had large hydro, large coal, large nuclear, and it was those uh, resources weren't available in every neighborhood. So we built this large transmission system that's divided into three regions in the U.S in order to supply power more economically. But one of the reasons that the, the political side of it hasn't worked is because utilities still cannot see a benefit in setting up, sort of dismantling the system and setting up microgrids. Uh, we have to realize that up to maybe 15 years ago, this was a very monopolized, subsidized uh, operation in the US. So we are going through stages of dismantling, unbundling this system and creating microgrid, and it's not going to take, it's going to take longer. It's not going to happen immediately because utilities still have control over uh, ownership of the wires and ownership of, of the uh, generating systems. In a sense, you can set up a microgrid in your system, but if the generating facility is not inside that microgrid that you have, you still have to permission. You need a permission from the local utility company to use the wires to bring power to your uh, place of consumption. So, and, you, and utilities have not released that ownership, and they still resist the fact that you want to set up a microgrid. And, and their view is that if you set up a microgrid, you're essentially taking the load away from them. But the fact is that utilities spend quite a bit of money now on enhancing the reliability, like what happened here in the Northeast not long ago, and what happened in the 2003 again here in the Northeast, that costs so much money. So localizing control and breaking the system up to the point that locally and regionally you can decide on the, on the operation of the system is going to be more beneficial to everyone. But uh, from a political point of view, they don't see it that way. And the reason they don't see it is because not everything is not defined still going through evolutions and revolutions. So until the business is settled, utilities are not going to relinquish what they own, and only until they uh, release that sort of a ownership and uh, management of that piece of equipment, microgrids may not be set up. Okay, BJ, what are the obstacles you see and how would we overcome them? So, let me describe where it is working and then I'll point out the obstacles. So if you are a hospital, or you are a university, or you are a large campus, and if you have a combination of diverse loads, some are office loads, some are residential loads, and the fact that you are a single entity as an institution, then today microgrids are both economically viable and provide reliability and negotiate something with the utility that is beneficial to both. So NYU is just deploying, uh, many universities have done it, Columbia is very seriously considering it and so on. One of the big you know, pluses has been, especially in the Northeast, you know, if you generate your own power, the waste heat can actually be utilized within your campus for domestic hot water, for space heating, so that provides an extra bit of benefit as well uh, to the campus. And, you know, offices use more electricity, uh, residences use more heat, so having those mix. Now, 
I want to put in a plug for a study we did. The map is on the <laughs> Columbia record. Bianca, who did a lot of the work, is That's sitting in the audience. That's vjmodi.org here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what we try to look at is, if we try to look at all the 900,000 buildings in New York, the same mix of buildings also exist within private owners, except there are multiple different owners. So, if we could, you know, and, and what's the bottleneck there? There are two kinds of bottlenecks that I see. One is simply the transaction cost of 10 people sitting down and agreeing to something, creating a legal vehicle for it, creating a third party entity perhaps that takes over that, that negotiates with. So, my view of this is that currently it is being done as one of projects. I am in, and that requires one-off engineering, one-off going to Department of Buildings, one-off permitting, very expensive. Is there a way we can identify like 100 blocks in New York City that are similar, that are prototypical blocks of the city that could all be simultaneously permitted, simultaneously, and, and you know, who is going to operate them? I don't even mind if the utility operates them. Right? Because they actually have the most experience currently doing it. Right? So if there is a way that could break the bottleneck that we are facing of early deployment, getting this process started, and uh, initially it is probably going to be gas-fired generation given the low cost of gas. Gas is an interesting characteristic, which is not true of nuclear power, that a giant, you know, gigawatt scale gas power plant is actually not that much more efficient than a 10 megawatt power plant that could serve a few blocks in New York City. Interesting. Josh, obstacles and ways to overcome them. Sure. So I think that for us to really think about about how to deploy these more broadly, we need to remember that utilities pay for things using ratepayer funds, using our dollars as we uh, that, that we pay in as part of getting the opportunity to use electricity. Um, and the PUCs are historically either elected officials or put, are put in positions by elected officials, which means that you've got some really interesting political forces at play here. Uh, the first is that, um, at least historically, low cost today wins, which means that there's a strong disincentive to approve long-term capital infrastructure unless it's really clear that it's going to lead to to, uh, to reduced costs relatively quickly. And you're seeing that in a number of states. Now, the East Coast and, and New York is relatively specialized, I, but this is, this, is a, this is a broad statement, but applies in most places in the country. I think just as importantly, um, because they are political bodies, there is a significant focus on the short term, on what's happening today. Now, you're starting to see in places, uh, and I think New York and the East Coast actually have a really exciting opportunity here because you have the primacy effect of Superstorm Sandy and all the people that were knocked out uh, of power for very long periods of time, that now there is this really significant focus on reliability and that, uh, that, that reliability impact is starting to be monetized. And so you can start to look at, at really being able to make that cost-benefit analysis make sense, um, which, which I think is your primary hurdle. As you move forward, I think that you're going to see, and you're starting to see, a lot Lot of a lot of mission critical facilities starting to think about this or starting to put in portions of a microgrid that they'll then tie together as we move forward. So you're starting to see much more energy efficiency focus uh, at mission critical facilities. You're starting to see uh, more renewable generation at mission critical facilities. You're starting to see building energy management systems and even uh, distributed, um, distributed so storage at these mission critical facilities. Now you just need the brain that goes on top of that that tells it how to operate. And I think you're going to start to see that moving forward. So what we're going to see uh, in the next five years, I would say, is, is a hybrid model where you've got your macro grid and then you've got your micro grids as you start to deploy outwards. But there's a huge political challenge of getting people okay with the fact that they're going to pay a little bit more now for benefits over uh, a longer period of time when it comes to electricity. Thank you. Matthew, what, what are the obstacles that you see and how would we overcome them? I think that uh, the, the biggest obstacle today is that um, technology approval 
for the way that we're trying to do things versus traditional interconnection um, is a whole new paradigm shift for the utilities and it requires new protocols. So we're actually sort of on a daily basis imagineering, if you like, a new um, way to do things with the utilities and they're being receptive but it's a long haul. Um, I've spent two and a half years developing a project in Brooklyn that I spend two, three days a week pushing the 200 ton concrete ball up a hill. And, you know, I get small victories and I bite off little pieces at a time and then move on. But I think that making the utilities understand what we're trying to do is of key importance. Um, it's not to demonize the utilities at all. Their first protocol is to make sure that what we do, A, doesn't damage their grid and B, doesn't hurt any of their line workers and nobody wants to see that. But at the same time, I think that this is a newer way to do things and it's a better way for everybody. And I think that financing is everything. You know, today financing doesn't exist to put this in place properly. And I think two ways that that potentially could be done. One is infrastructure financing, which has been done very, very successfully in France. Um, there was an energy efficiency infrastructure fund which was backed by the French Teachers Union and they became a financial partner in the project and got some multi-megawatt wind and solar systems done and then the cost of the project was amortized and turned into a power purchase agreement and they had some pretty successful returns around 20% on those so I think they ended up being a win-win. I think New York City and Toronto and London could take a page from those books and get uh, the local governments. We would love to see New York City participate in helping to set up a group of people to finance those. And then of course the other option is for you to form a partnership, a public-private partnership, as some of the other panelists discussed. Um, you have to be very careful because there are con some, some constraints there when you take multiple buildings. A university campus is a great example because the university use, usually owns its own distribution system. But in an example like the project in Brooklyn, we're going into some very, very gray areas. We're trying to cross public roadways and a lot of people scream uncle as soon as you start to do that, but if you take it little by little, you can achieve your goals. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Go ahead. Basically, I want to add uh, something to Matthew pointed out, and that is in uh, suburban locations in Chicago, um, uh, Josh and I have worked on uh, with the local uh, governments to set up or well, at least look into the possibility of setting some microgrids. The problem they have goes back to what Matthew said, and that is since they do not own the local distribution system, it is almost impossible at this time to set up a microgrid. If you take a suburban location, I live in a suburb in Chicago called Naperville, and they own their own grid. So we have our own microgrid. We set it up because the city owns the grid so they can do whatever fancy things they want. But in other parts of the uh, Chicago area, because suburban locations do not own the grid, and the grid is still owned by the large, larger utility, no matter how much they try, until we change the political picture, they will not be able to set up a microgrid because utility controls the electrons and runs on those wires. And at this time, it's impossible to sort of take the ownership of that. But, but I also want to point out one other thing, and that is the political issue is because there is a major shift of paradigm. We're talking about the system here in the US, and I have to be careful because much of the funding for my work comes from utilities. <laughs> uh, we're you know, we're taping about, this. We're, we're talking about a system where if you don't have power in your house, you have to pick up the phone, call your local utility, and then an hour later you see the utility truck driving around the neighborhood looking for a feeder that doesn't have power. I mean, the system cannot automatically identify the location and re-heal, reclose the breaker to the point that you'll have power. Now, by the installation of these smart meters, the utility company and control system within the utility will identify the location and fix that. But setting up a microgrid is such a major shift of paradigm that political 
change and whatever we need to do in order to sell the microgrid will take quite a bit of time. And it's not going to be as an easy task. Okay. So, thank you. At this point, what I'd like to do is uh, see if there's some questions from the audience. We have time for about three or four of them. Um, let me just ask you uh, first if, uh, to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I'd appreciate it if it was a question and not a small speech. Uh, and if you could tell us who you are, that would also be nice. So, somebody want a, a question over here? Do we have a microphone in the front row? Hi, my name is Sylvia Syracuse, and I host events in Washington on broadband policy issues. And so my question is, um, what role does broadband access and broadband speeds play in the success of microgrids? And can, they, um, can, can higher and better access increase the likelihood of the success of microgrids? Okay, anybody want to take that? Matthew? Uh, I'll start with that. Uh, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, I think... I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Sure. The question was concerning the impact of broadband in the reliability and the success of microgrids. And I think that, um, you know, control paradigms are going to be everything, as the panelists discussed, with building management systems, with integration with other forms, something we haven't even touched on yet, which is electric vehicle charging, and how to manage everything so that it all happens. Uh, simultaneously and in a synchronized fashion without anything breaking. So access to broadband will be everything. Uh, the brain piece that Josh was talking about, overlay on the top, the control algorithms are everything. If you don't have that, you don't have a microgrid that you can control. And obviously, you know, one other thing to touch on with that is cybersecurity. So it's important that it's going to be an encrypted data protocol so that everything can remain tamper-proof. Okay. Another question from perhaps this side? Uh, let's see, in the back there. Okay. Hi, Bruce Rosen, uh, member of the general public. I'm assuming that the uh, beneficialness of a microgrid would be economic and environmental. And I'm wondering if you think that the focus should be on sustainable forms of energy rather than reinventing reuse of carbon or nuclear sources. Anybody want to try that? Mohammed? Yeah. As I pointed out, there are basically three uh, benefits. There are major reasons for setting up a microgrid. The foremost is the reliability, and the other two are sustainability and dealing with the issues like carbon, and the third one is economics. And in that respect, uh, setting up the local systems to the point that you can manage your load, shift your load to the point that you can reduce uh, the carbon emission in a form of a microgrid makes it much easier. Uh, in Chicago, over 50% in the northern part of Illinois, about 75% of the power generation is nuclear. And the other 25% is coal, some hydro, some gas, and all that. Uh, I tell my guys that every time at night, you guys uh, start your washing machine and dishwasher and TVs and computers and everything else at 8 o'clock at night, you're forcing utility company to turn on one more coal unit because we are maxed on the nuclear side. Many of those loads that we are using at night, let's say at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. rather, are non-essential. There are some loads that you could shift to non-essential or non-peak hours and get rid of the peak that would force all those coal units to come in. Uh, and the only way you can do that is by local control and setting up these microgrids. Okay. Can I, Steve? Sure, go ahead, Vijay. Uh, I, I think, so I'll give a New York City perspective as a more as a consumer. <clears throat> so, of the f what I pay for the electricity, as I said, one part is for the electricity, and the other three parts are for somebody reliably delivering that electricity to me. What I would like to see as a consumer is of those three parts, 
that currently go to reliability and to the utility to deliver, one of the parts out of those three is for me to have more clean power with lower emissions. And I think it is possible to have a utility find a way to mix that one part of payment for cleaner and two parts. Let me give you one simple example. This is, um, so we are focusing on an electric mini grid. But the end use of energy in New York City is actually dominated by heat and not electricity. So, and the almost entirely all of our heating comes from gas or oil, as opposed to electricity, which actually significant part of it comes from hydro and nuclear. Now, we are looking at ways in which currently everybody is thinking of using wind power to primarily supply the electricity needs of the city. But it turns out wind power is not well correlated with our electric demand. Wind blows strongly in the winter or at night when the electricity demand is less. We are looking at how to use wind to run heat pumps which multiply the eff effectiveness of that electricity to produce heat and create a much more cleaner grid so I think we have to also look that in future, we are looking at increased electrification of what is today not provided electrically. And there are opportunities there that can make it cleaner. Okay, very interesting. Uh, over here, uh, a question? Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, my name is Salil. Uh, I'm an applied researcher on the practice of sustainability. Uh, before I present my question, this is really a pilgrimage for me to come to Earth Institute. I had been an alumnus, but based in Beijing. Uh, the, my point is uh, from economies of scale, which is the basis of large utilities. Here is a shift. So what is the new economies, uh, what is the alternative to the economies of scale? Is it the economics of ownership? Because a uh, microgrid would be successful not only by the generators, but by the behavioral change of the users. So off-peak could be uh, supplemented by a user by changing their usage patterns maybe starting off early for work, etc. So what is the response of this panel to this shift? Do we have a response? Okay, Mohammed. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, I, I pointed out earlier that when we talk about smart grid, really the part that is really smart is a smart customer. We can talk about the equipment and devices and switches and all that, but uh, we as customers are the one that decide well, how the load profile is going to look like. Right now there is a huge peak uh, in the evening because everybody has lights on, TVs on and everything else. And we are the one that are going to, by setting up microgrids, will be able to dictate and manage the profile to the point that economics will really take place. And on top of that we can start generating locally. Uh, to the point that you, we can utilize our own generators, we can utilize the rooftop solar. At hours that it is much more economical, like at night. And, and of course, it, it is possible that, uh, as my colleague was pointed out, that the, the time of the peak for the load and then time of the peak for uh, renewable generation do not coincide. And then there you have to bring other means uh, in order to sort of make them uh, coincide. And one way of doing that is subject that is being discussed quite heavily is uh, related to utilizing electric vehicles so that the battery of electric car could uh, distributed form of uh, battery storage could be used in order to manage uh, the uh, sort of uncertainty that is associated with the renewable energy. Matthew? I, I think just to add something to uh, the other panelists comments I think the economies of scale will also change 
drastically when you start to see storage incorporated into it. You know, as soon as you incorporate wind, the wind doesn't blow when you need it to, the sun doesn't shine at night. If you can shift the paradigm by adding storage to the mix, it changes everything. You know, FedEx in Lower Manhattan has a pilot project for 100 trucks, which are 30 kilowatts each. That's a three megawatt load on the grid when they're charging those vehicles. If you can do it with sustainable resources or do it in a different way with managed time, you know, three megawatts is a small town power load. So I think that economies of scale will come, and unfortunately it's a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the application, if it's mission critical, how much you're going to take from the grid, and how much you're going to generate. Okay, uh, over here. Hi, my name is Pamela Quinlan. I am an alumni of the Earth Institute, one of their programs, and full disclosure, I also do energy policy work for Con Edison. <laughs> um, but I don't really focus too much on this side of it, more some of the bigger federal issues uh, from the wholesale side. But what I'm struggling with, and I really appreciate the discussion today, I think for me I've learned quite a bit, um, but I'm still trying to understand for a grid like New York City, for Con Ed's system in particular, where we have networks that are broken down into specific places, and maybe post-Sandy those need to be redrawn a bit. Um, and it's designed by regulation that it has to be as reliable as built to a loss of load of one in 10 years. And we have a, for those that don't know, um, the electric grid in the United States, you need to be built to withstand two large contingencies. So once the first contingency happens, you need to still be able to then fix the second contingency. So reliability is a pretty, pretty big thing, and that's what the grid is built for. So what I found surprising is that one of the drivers that you're pointing to for this would be reliability. And I guess what I'm trying to struggle to understand is what problem do you see the microgrid solving in an advanced grid like New York, where you have scale, where you have um, reliability that is, that is quite strong. And I understand like, there's points to a smart grid that's already being implemented where there's certain areas can kind of shut themselves down and large demand response is exploding and there's lots of renewables being integrated into the large grid. So what does, the, what does a microgrid solve that the traditional large scale grid as it's evolving into a smarter grid does not solve? Anybody? You want to start, Matthew? No, it sounds like that, you have a little interest in this question. Yeah, I, I think that it's something very uh, close to my heart. So I think if you look at uh, how reliable was the grid? And this is not to demonize Con Edison. They do a tremendous job and they're yeah, very forward thinking. We have light but demonized, so we don't just... Um, <laughs> right. But there were tens of thousands of people in NYCHA housing complexes without power for eight, ten days. That's not the failure of Con Edison to come out. It's cascading failures that basically bring down the grid. As it gets more and more stressed, you have a domino effect and it brings out bigger and bigger pieces. Uh, typically speaking, housing, urban housing developments that were built 40, 50 years ago are usually built in areas where they were close proximity to the city, but they still had enough space to build the uh, sections. They're at the end of the um, utility grid at the end of the distribution point so it's very hard to hang generation on there with traditional interconnection unless you do backup diesel. In a case like Sandy there wasn't enough diesel to go around in the northeast so there were widespread outages. So by having a shift of paradigm and changing the model from Con Edison's um, network grid over to a series of microgrids that they can own and rate base they would, you're not going to eliminate storm outages like Sandy completely, but you know, we've had five, five 100 year storms in the last five years, which either makes me incredibly old or something bad going on with the weather. And I think that, um, you know, as we try and meet those needs, and I, you know, I have lots of friends at Con Edison that were working round the clock, so my hat goes off to them how they tried to restore power. But I think if you break this down, as I said before, into bite-sized pieces, you'll get some outages, but you just won't get the massive cascading failures. Okay, Josh? So I think that where, where at least I'm seeing microgrids that have been historically particularly successful um, are in areas where the infrastructure is really starting to get old and is starting to fail. And so this is an opportunity to, um, 
to upgrade the infrastructure, but make it more resilient, particularly for critical facilities. And I'm sure Mohammed can uh, tell the story much better than I can about what went on at IIT, where really the challenge was that the infrastructure was really significantly degraded. And the question was, do you invest in, up in updating the the way that it has always been done, or in fact, do you take another? Do you take a look at another way to to uh, increase reliability for a for a, a feeder that was particularly uh, non-reliable? And so, I think that that's really what you're looking at, particularly right now, is opportunities where you can, where you have a decision point that's being forced because you've got old infrastructure available. Okay, Mohammed. When uh, when we talk about the reliability, it's basically physical and cyber. And cyber, the subject of cyber now is being discussed much more heavily. It's a, it's a buzzword for those of you who are looking for funding. Uh, anything related to cyber physical security right now in Washington you know, excites somebody to provide funding to do research. Uh, and I think the issue with the cyber is as important as physical. We talk about physical to make sure that system is reliable in n minus 1, n minus 2. If the system loses one component, a couple of components, they're still in the operating mode. But the cyber part of it is something that you can manage much more easily by microgrid. When you localize the control, it is much easier to make sure that the system remains in a reliable sense. When you ask one control system to manage the entire New York City, uh, the job gets to be both from a physical and cyber significantly more difficult than if you had divided a city in New York or in Chicago to hundreds of smaller systems that they can control it locally in case there is an issue. So that's from a reliability point of view. But one more important, I mean, uh, equally important subject for the microgrid is the fact that we see the sort of advent of uh, renewables resources being added throughout the system everywhere in the US, solar, wind, you name it. When you add so much uncertainty to the system, it is much easier to control the system in a local term, as opposed to asking one uh, control system to uh, manage the entire uh, eastern part of the United States, or half of the uh, eastern part of the United States. Uh, what utilities are doing right now when they see so much uh, solar and wind added to the system, they are building more generators uh, uh, so that they can bring it into operation in case uh, solar is not, in, in case the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. That issue is, makes the operation of the system much more expensive. However, if you do it in a local sense, so where the local control system and local operators in a much smaller system know the behavior of the load, that uncertainty can be managed uh, much more strongly. Okay, I think I want to make that the last word of our formal part of the panel. Uh, first, I uh, want to thank uh, the panelists for what was a terrific set of discussions. And uh, I hope uh, that you will stay with us and the panel will stay with us. We have uh, in the back of the room refreshments and I think it would be really a good uh, energy efficient way to continue this discussion uh, to move to the micro brews uh, in the back of the room uh, and continue this discussion informally. Thank you all for coming tonight.